Hi everyone, I'm Andre. Uh, our local paragliding club every year does a parachute repack, so uh, we're just here about to do one. And I thought it might be um, interesting for you guys to have a look at what goes into repacking a parachute for those who've never done it. So I want to thank Bernard, Bill and John for letting us do this. And yeah, enjoy it. Right, good afternoon everybody. I hope you can all hear me over the general background din. Welcome to 2018 Repack. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Bernard Kluwer. Uh, I've been organising these repacks now since about, I think it was 2003 we had the first one. Uh, this is the first year where we've had two sessions in one day. Um, so far it seems to have gone okay, um, but if it does go pear shaped this afternoon, please just bear with us on that. Uh, we are being filmed apparently. Andre is recording this for us. <laughs> so uh, if you want to ask us silly questions you might want to wait till we finish this bit. Uh, with me today I've got Bill Morris and John Warden who are both up at that end of the room. Um, what Bill and John don't know about repacks and reserves isn't worth knowing, so any questions, please feel free to ask them. Uh, also today, I've got Chris and Ed, who are there, who've both done the repackers course and are now uh, trying to get experience and practice before they do their exams. Right, so, um, this afternoon, it's not all about how to fold the, the parachute up and put it back in its bag, um, although that's fairly important, it's not the be all and end all of, the, of what goes on. We have a system which is uh, comprised of several parts, um, the reserve and its bag which will probably look something like this, and then there's the harness. The actual reserve and the bag are probably made by one manufacturer, the handle and the harness by another manufacturer, and the trick is to get them to work together in harmony. Okay. Um, so we're going to have some tips about you know, how it works, uh, some tips about how you can decrease your deployment time and what to do in the case of emergency. Terminology, anybody not familiar with those, all those terms on there? Um, in particular, what we call the mouth lock at the bottom there is where we've got a bite of lines through some sort of elastic closure system that holds the inner bag or deployment bag around the actual reserve quite a key part of the system that because if this doesn't come undone then your reserve is not going to deploy and you're going to hit the ground fairly fast. Uh, deployment bags usually some sort of clover leaf thing shaped like this with various bits of elastic on them that hold things in place. Uh, some of the ones like the gin ones tend to be more of an envelope pocket type affair. So a picture of why we, we do have repacks. Example there of a, a bag that's gone rotten when the handles come off the actual deployment bag. <coughs> Types of reserve, pull down apex, most common, been around for years and years, very reliable, works well. Um, 
Most of us still have those. Uh, annulars made by companies like Independence, basically a, a pull down reserve on steroids, just a bit beefier and, and fatter. Some weird ones that never took off. And, uh, regalos, anybody brought a regalo this afternoon? No, good, a nightmare to pack. Um, and squares, um, basically a, a round canopy sort of shaped into a square. Uh, word on the street is these are probably going to become um, you know, the most common one used. Uh, they're easier and cheaper to make than round, so I think um, manufacturers are going to be more and more selling squares rather than reserves. They pack in much the same way as a, as a round, but they're a bit more fiddly because you've got the square corners that tend to sort of stick out and get in the way a little bit. As before, uh, we always try and push you to buy reserves that have been tested by an independent test house. Things have come on a long way since the earlier days and most, most of the reserves out there are, are certified. Uh, most common cause of paragliding accidents is low level collapses. Um, when we're flying near to the hill, coming into land, when we're flying in the, in the boundary layer where there's more turbulence, uh, we're more likely to go to collapse. In that situation, you need to be switched on and be, be prepared to use a reserve. And I've got some, some slides later on about that. So when you come to do your test deployment, there's three things that you've got to do to make sure your reserve works. First one being find the handle on the harness and pull it so that these pins, um, they may be pins or they may be bits of plastic wire, come out of the loops in the harness and this package is then comes out of the pocket on the harness. You then have to throw this lock, stock and barrel such that this mouth lock comes open and the reserve is then in free air and will open. If any of that fails, if you can't get those pins to come out, if that mouth lock doesn't open, then it, the reserve is not going to come out and it's going to be a problem. So when you do your throw, put the harness on, um, pull it, and throw it, and make sure that it comes out into free air. If it doesn't, come and find one of us and we'll have a look at it for you. Deployment time. A bit like um, braking distance on a car. The manufacturer is probably going to give you a figure of three seconds, four seconds um, for, the, for the canopy to be open. That's when it's in that state there. It's got air into it and then it will, it will fluff up and open. What takes a lot more time is, is you becoming aware of the problem deciding that you can't sort it out, reaching for the handle and pulling the pins and throwing. So you need to have a, be of a mindset, if it goes pear-shaped, then be prepared to use the reserve. Handle location, um, usually somewhere down on your right-hand side. The next time you go flying, if it's safe to do so, just reach down and tap yourself where you actually, where the handle actually is. And that's called body memory, and it'll help you when you actually come to have to do this for real. If you are, do have to do it for real, don't just reach down for the handle. Look for it, because you'll be flailing around as the glider's thrashing around you. And that will make it much more difficult to get to the ha your, get your hand to the handle. Um, just as a, as a for instance, back in the days when I used to fly hang gliders, 
I had a chest-mounted reserve. And I originally thought, oh, the handle's going to be up here on my chest. When I actually tried reaching for it, I found it was actually right down here, sort of on my stomach. So next time you're flying, just reach down and feel where that handle actually is. We've had adverts and sky wings along these lines. Uh, low level collapse, you've not got time to be messing around trying to sort it out, especially if it started to spin. Um, so if you're low, just throw it. Um, I'm not aware of anybody who's actually died because they've thrown the reserve. But plenty of people have died, have died because they've, they've spun into the hill. Uh, and if in doubt, get it out. Coaches, any coaches here? Um, if you're talking to new pilots on the, on the hill, um, remind them if you're talking on reserves that the handle is not a rip cord like in a skydiving rig. You actually have to throw this whole thing away from you, so you throw it and let go. Uh, there have been people, um, the uh, Thames Valley Club, the Big Fat Repack, they have a a zip wire where people can go down and um, throw it and there have been people that have just come down holding it and they get to the end and say well, why didn't you throw it and they say oh some tips about if you have deployed it um, try and disable the wing the main wing um, <coughs> if the main wing should reinflate and you're, you're under reserve what can happen is they'll, they'll downplane where the two will sort of fold out from each other and your descent rate will, will go up in that situation. And they'll probably start doing this, they'll probably start oscillating and you'll be all over the place. So try and grab something, pull the main in and, and keep hold of it. Um, be prepared for a PLF. Who's practiced those recently? <laughs> mm. probably about the time I took this slide out. This is some recommend, recommended descent rate is five and a half meters a second. Um, quite a lot of the reserves these days, you'll come down slower than that anyway. But five and a half meters a second, that's like jumping off a six foot wall, so, um, which is still pretty high. I think most people, if they were asked to do that, would, would, would sort of look, look twice at that one. Uh, so I've been through that really. Uh, yeah, don't, don't take the reserve off the harness. Um, what tends to happen if you do that, if you take it off, is you'll probably end up getting the end of the bridle wrapped around some lines um, and you'll get twists in it. So leave it on the harness because you'll find it much more difficult to get the harness through the lines. Uh, pop and pull, we've been through this again. Uh, <coughs> for those of <coughs> those that you've uh, not been before, when you pull the handle, the elastics on the harness will sort of make a popping noise, so we call that pop. Um, but the key thing here is, especially for harnesses where the reserve is sort of underneath and in quite a narrow pocket, uh, some of the fancy um, pod type harnesses uh, suffer from this. The direction that you pull the handle is not the direction that the reserve wants to come out of that pocket. So take a look at your harness and just look at the way the pins are lined up, which way you need to pull the handle to get the pins to come out, and then which way you need to pull to get the reserve to slide out of the harness. More than likely it's gonna be sort of an upwards action for the pins to come out and then an outwards direction to get the, the, the deployment back to come out of your harness. So, all right, some, some demonstrations. Um, okay, first one I'm gonna do, because it's, it's set up, is, is the line check. Um, if you've got a system like this, 
sort of rather tatty one here. If you can't see, do, do move around and, and get a bit closer. If you've got a, a system where the lines are neatly tied on around that, you can do what we call a four line check, which is a, a method to, to make sure you've not got any twists in the lines. Can you just hold that for me? If you take the two lines that are adjacent to this big, thick apex one and run them to the, up to the, the canopy, you'll find they've run clear. They're not wrapped around any of these other lines. And in the same way as you take the ones that are furthest away from the apex line, if you can see this, which is that one and that one, These two will run clear to the very bottom of the canopy. And if, the, if you've got the top lines and the bottom lines running clear, that means all your lines are clear and there's no twists in it. If you okay, can pop that down now, thanks. If you've got a system like this one, where they're sort of knotted around in a, a lark's head, you can't do that check. Um, and you just have to sort of do a visual inspection to make sure they're, they look okay. Um, okay. Who here's got an APCO Mayday? Two, all right, okay, Can we go through this one then. Uh -huh. So you've thrown it and it's come out of its bag and it's in a Little bit of a mess on the floor. John, you're going to take that in for us. So to get it under control and into some sort of order, you find the apex, the top of it, which is in there somewhere. We pick it up. And we're going to do what's called flake in the gauze or a gravity flake, which basically means you're going to follow each panel, follow the hem around each panel, lift it up, have a look at it, check for any obvious damage, and take it down. Follow the hem round, don't just blasily reach over, because what can happen is you can have panels tucked down inside and if you just reach over you'll miss out this panel and you'll come to us telling that your reserve has got an odd number of panels. Um, I've not come across one yet that does have an odd number of panels. Um, so you follow the hem round panel by panel and you're looking for your reference panel, which will have some sort of indication on it. It might be the number one, it might be a, um, a serial number. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to cheat. But, or it might be a, a stamp from the manufacturer. Once you've been around the whole thing and you've got back to your reference panel, you can then split it in two. So, is this an 18, this one, I think? <laughs> um, assuming this is an 18 gore, you're going to have nine on each side. So, we count one, two, three, four, five, three, nine. And we lay it down. So, that's the first stage, which we call flaking the gauze. Next stage on one of these is to pull the apex down. And I bet I've just gone and twisted that up. So I just grab hold of the bridle, the end of it, and slowly pull. And you can see the apex at the top there, because that line is a bit shorter, it's being pulled down. And I keep going until all the lines are tight. And you shouldn't have a load of twists in it like we have on that one now. That's a 
second stage pulling down the apex. And the third stage is we're going to tidy it all up. So we take everything on one side, fold it over to the other side, and then panel by panel, so what I'm doing at this end is sticking my finger <coughs> through the tape and again this one, making sure there's tension on the top and then on the bottom as well. And you can feel there's a right place where it's got tension on both sides, holding both of them there and then I can pull that one out. Hold this one down. Sort the next one out. You'll notice there that panel was inside the other one, which is because when I did the gravity flake, I cheated and skipped a few out for the speed of uh, the demo. Okay, so we bring back half the panels, fine in this case onto that side. And then the next stage is we take everything from that side over. And again, we bring panel by panel back again. Okay, so we repeat that and we end up with our reference panel back on the top. This is the point at which most manuals will say to do your line reference check, um, which I always think is a bit of a waste because if it is wrong, you, you're probably going to mess your, your nice neat folding up, checking it. Um, so you might want to think about doing it just after you've done your gravity flake and, and laid it out on the floor. I suspect if I tried this one again, it's not going to work. Is it untangled? Is it, is it, is it, it be an example of it being in a mess? Yes, this, this, is, this is exactly why we ask you not to take them off, off the harness, because it is so easy to... Perfect. Okay, next stage of doing an, an APCO Mayday type. Uh, is folding it into a long sausage. Um, different manufacturers have different ideas on how to do this, but we'll show you the APCO one because it involves creating a little air channel. So you pick up the panel, can be either, either of these panels, it doesn't really matter. Put your fingers inside and spread it out to make a little air channel there to catch the air. You then fold in the corners. At 45 degrees. And then I'm going to fold this point here into the center, which 
John is going to do a similar fold at his end, but a much smaller one, so that he ends up, we end up with a, a parallel. I'm going to do the same on this side, take this corner, fold it into the center. Keeping my little air channel out. And then we're going to fold the thing in half again. And as I do that, I'm just pulling, can you all see that? I just tease that out so that it's lying along this edge. Okay. And that is the basic APCO fold. Uh, thereafter, you then stack it onto the, onto the deployment bag. Before we show you that, we'll just demonstrate. If you've got packing loops, top of the canopy, about two thirds up, you thread a piece of string around all the loops, making sure you don't miss any out. Then pick it up and just shove the apex down inside and then pull it tight like that we can now do uh, both the gravity flake and squaring it in one operation so we go around the whole glider panel by panel as before making sure nothing's tucked inside John can square that end off as he goes. And basically, we go round till we end up with the reference panel on the top, and then we lay it down. And that's both operations done in one go. Just lay it down. I think John's enough for that. Um, is it worth showing him a five way fold? Uh, Trick for a five-way fold, some of the um, gliders don't fold up like the APCO one. You sort of S-fold it up. Is this a bit unbalanced? <laughs> um, right, which way are we going? Five-way fold is you're basically moving one hand on top of the other hand. So I'll take everything in one hand and I move it over onto the other hand. You're aiming to have the lines in the center of the fold like that. And then similarly, you put hand underneath there and lift it over onto the back of your other hand. And that's how you do a five-way fold. Um, Right, okay. Uh, back to the APCO. This is a, a typical knackered APCO deployment bag. You wouldn't have a knot, ordinarily have a knot in the elastic, but this one's so um, worn out and lost all of its elasticity, we've had to put a knot in it just for, for demo purposes. Whatever bag you've got, unless it's um, one of the little gin type envelope bags, we always suggest folding the glider onto the bag. Your manuals will often say, fold it all up and then pick it up and put it on the bag. Um, our experience is that's very tricky because this stuff's quite slippery um, and it will run away from you. Also folding it onto the bag, you can use the bag size as a template um, to work out how big you need to make your folds. When you do the first fold, we recommend you make it slightly smaller than from the, from the hem. This hem's a bit thicker than the rest of the glider, so if you put, folded this on top of it, you'd end up with a stack that tends to do that. Plus it leaves then a little space to actually fold the lines into. And our tip for the keeping the top under control is just to wrap the nose under. Um, 
on on the May days, you would normally have I've lost one here. On this elastic, you've got two bands on each side. These are where the lines are going to be stowed after you've closed up three of the. So you've put through the elastic through three of the flaps and then you lock that off with a mouth lock like that. You can then stow the lines. So you'd S them up. Again, using the bag as a template to get the width right. So good. Um, as I've said before, you've got two sets of bands on each side of this elastic. Ordinarily, there's one missing on this one. So what you do is you doesn't matter how many of these loops you've got, just divide it into two. Um, so I'm going to split this one there, and you then just pick up the loops from one side get into the lower band. You then take the loops, the remaining loops, to the upper band and I've got a loop missing from there so I'm just going to stuff that in. You then take the fourth flap and leaving this mouth lock in place you'd pull this elastic through the fourth flap and close that off with a second mouth lock. Other manufacturers don't have two mouth locks, but the APCO Mayday does. Other ones, you fold all four flaps up um, and close it off with just one mouth lock. Any questions, anybody? Um, so, yes, we've been to, yeah, we've done that, done that, done all that. Okay. Um, Next stage will be to put it back in the harness. Um, I can't really demonstrate that because there's so many different harnesses out there, so many different reserve manufacturers. We'll be here all day trying to work out all the different combinations. Um, if you're struggling with that, come and find us and we'll help you sort that out. Um, so if you'd like to sit down again, I think there's... So we've been through flaking the gauze where we're using gravity to make sure we've not got any hidden panels anywhere that have got tucked down the side. Uh, as you're doing that, just look at the glide. If you can see something obviously wrong with it, then that's a problem. If you have to peer at it really closely, then, then it's not worth worrying about. Uh, check the deployment bag for um, the metal grommets, make sure there's no sharp edges on those. Size and load, most, most reserves these days are size big enough for us. Not like in the old days where hang glider pilots used to come down with tiny little things that were trying to bring down 100 kilos of weight. Uh, check your suspension lines, make sure they've not been caught on Velcro and they've gone all furry and, and, 
and horrible. Uh, good opportunity just to make sure you are actually have actually got your reserve attached to the harness. There have been incidents where we've we've peeled back the Velcro flaps just to find the the ends of the bridle just been laid there and not actually attached to the harness. Yeah, check your, connect, your connectors are done up. Uh, good opportunity just to have a, a once over on your harness. Um, make sure if you've got a carbon seat plate, make sure that's not been cutting through any of these leg straps or anything nasty like that. Uh, bands. Um, we don't like, we don't want to see the deployment bag tied to the reserve. Uh, there have been incidents in the early days where people have managed to tie it on and it's stopped, it's held all the lines together and that's stopped the canopy from opening. Uh, and we don't like to see webbing to webbing connectors. Um, there should be a mailing in between them. Um, so you might want to check that because sometimes we find that the shoulder straps, they've just studied the, the webbing of the wide bridle through the, the loops on the harness. Uh, we've done that. Um, that's a classic um, picture of a classic era where you've got the lines at the out, outer edge of the, of the canopy. When you've got it laid out on the floor, the lines should be in the middle with the canopy spread out on either side of it like a, like a Christmas tree. Uh, we've been through doing the line reference check. Uh, square in the top where you've taken everything over one side and then carefully folded the panels back and then taken the other side over and folded it back again. Using the packing loops. Yes, remember, take that cord out and when, once you've got it into the sausage state and you're about to pack it into the bag. Been through that, pack it onto the onto the, put the put the deployment bag underneath and pack it onto that because you can use that as a template to, to gauge the size and the hem step. Uh, and there's there's a various examples of all the different ways you can store the lines. Um, Mouth lock tension test. Once you've got it back into the bag, into the deployment bag, before you put it back into the harness, just pick it up by these lines and make sure as you lift, this is coming out. If you can lift this so that the whole thing comes off the deck, then it's probably going to be a bit tight and we need to look at that because there's too much tension on that. Uh, Once you've put it back into the harness, just pick the harness up and put your knee in the back of it or put it on and give it a good wriggle just to make sure it's not all too tight and it's gonna um, pop the pins uh, as you sit, sit back into it and pop out. And make sure you've not got your speed bar rooted through um, the handle or anything daft like that. So as we've said this half a dozen times, please don't take the reserve off the harness. Um, Finally, we don't want you to use these. Even though you've got it nicely packed and it's all, all going to work nicely, we'd far rather that you never use this. So fly sensibly, um, but be prepared to use it. Um, when you're coming into land after a good day's flying, don't switch off until you're on the deck. Fly the glider onto the ground because, as, as we said before, most accidents happen when we're close to the terrain. So be aware, don't switch off until you're safely on the ground. Okay, anybody, any questions? No? Okay, so when you do your deployment, um, we'll go across the room. Uh, there's not so many of you this afternoon, so it's probably not so bad, but if you do nose to tail, we can get more of you in. Um, if you've got, come with, come with somebody, your loved ones, cherished ones, mate, whatever, and you want to work with them, uh, please make your way that way. Um, 
We'll work in pairs because it's much easier to do it in pairs than on your own. So, no. Thank you. Feels the same. Yes.